Brothers and sisters, good afternoon. Again, I'm um, so thankful for Owen Strand's message early, from earlier this morning because he helped lay the architecture and the foundation for what we're going to be talking about during this session. Owen talked about this understanding of complementarity, that God made us gendered persons. And as we dig into this talk about marriage, we have to begin with that most basic assumption that God made us men and women. And if that he didn't make us men and women, there wouldn't be marriage to begin with. So I just want to say thank you to Owen again for setting up um, this talk. It makes you wonder that this talks were maybe organized and scheduled appropriately, in fact. So I have a question to kick off this session. Um, are there any Nicholas Sparks fans in the room, or at least anyone who will admit to it? Okay, I see a few hands in the audience. Very good. Um, you might recall who Nicholas Sparks is. He's the author of numerous romance novels like The Notebook, and he's the author of these types of stories that depict idealized portraits of love and happily ever after, where each couple kind of sails off into marital bliss. Um, and to his credit, he crafts a narrative of marriage that's also noble. It portrays marriages as long-suffering and patient and, and sticking it out to the end. But something very ironic happened with the fact that Nicholas Sparks was the author and creator of all these wonderful romance novels that depict marriage so wonderfully. It was announced last January 2015 that he and his own wife were separating, which is no small amount of irony. That the premier romance novelist in America had a marriage that apparently broke down. You would think that someone who crafted and told a picture of marriage so beautifully would live up to his vision of marriage in his own life. Now, I don't know the conditions of what happened there, and I'm not trying to pick on Nicholas Sparks in general or make him a particular um, portrait of hypocrisy. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm simply trying to trot his anecdote and his situation out for this simple truth that's going to serve as the foundation for how we think about marriage in this session. That the picture of marriage sold in today's society doesn't live up to the biblical model. And secondly, that the picture of marriage thrown around today is the very reason we've gotten where we are with marriage's decline and redefinition. So you think about how Hollywood glam glamorizes marriages as the climaxing fulfillment of long sought after love. Again, every movie, it seems, ends with this relationship heading toward the altar. Yet when we look at actual Hollywood and the actual picture of marriages that are coming out of Hollywood celebrity marriages, what do we see actually happening? You've seen them at the tabloids. You see that there's a divorce by some famous Hollywood couple happening every single week. And in fact, I remember seeing one tabloid in the supermarket that was talking about what was the secret to some long Hollywood marriages. And you might think a long Hollywood marriage was 60 years, right? Well, by Hollywood standards, a long successful marriage was but 10 years long. I say all of that again to illustrate that the culture's conception of marriage is deeply flawed. So we have to ask, is the picture that culture is, is the picture that culture is selling on marriage worth buying? And I believe the answer to that question is no, and I intend to show you why and why the biblical view of marriage offers a better alternative, one that both glorifies God and promotes human flourishing. So the goals for today's talk. First, I want us to understand what has happened in the culture concerning, concerning marriage. And this, is, I'm going to warn you in advance, is kind of the longest most technical, technical section. We, do, we have to figure out how we got to where we are today. We want to understand why these shifts in thinking about marriage are problematic. To understand the nature and purpose of marriage according to the scripture. 
and to understand the public relevance of the Christian worldview surrounding marriage. And then lastly, to show why Christians cannot give up or cede control of marriage to society that many of us right now are just tempted to do because of how it's faring, because of how the Supreme Court has ruled, because of, quite frankly, the uncomfortableness it is right now to be an evangelical Christian who holds to a belief about marriage in the public square. So let's ask this first question, what has happened in culture? And I'm going to give you the answer straight up right now, that we've had mistaken assumptions about what marriage is about in the first place. Again, as the story is often told in America, those marriages are most romantic or those whose marriages are the happiest are the marriages that are most likely to survive. And why is this? Because we have to see that today's culture views marriage often through emotional, personal, or sentimental terms. Marriage, we're told, is primarily about a couple's happiness. As Owen so rightfully said, that we think of marriage primarily in terms of compatibility. That's exactly correct. It's again thought of in sentimental terms. It's this gushy, over-the-top portrayal of marriage that sees the whole purpose of marriage as based, as the, as based in the emotional or sexual fulfillment of the, of the couple. Now, uh, I wrote a book called Marriage Is, How Marriage Transforms Society and um, promotes or cultivates human flourishing. And in that book, um, I use a phrase that I call marriage the great unexamined assumption of our time. It's the unexamined assumption of our time. It's an institution that almost everyone in this room aspires to enter. But we seem as a culture, despite our love and our affection and our promotion and our esteem of of marriage in our culture, we seem to be getting it wrong as a culture. You think from the youngest of ages that small girls begin idealizing what their future wedding day will look like. Already my five-year-old daughter is talking about her husband. She's already talking about what it will be like to walk down an aisle in a white dress as a five-year-old. Yet at the same time, we promote culture like that, but what else do we do? We have a culture that engages in such things as prenuptial engagements, which prenuptial engagements, really what they are, are just kind of pre-divorces that help settle the terms of the divorce before the divorce actually gets there. (laughs) So there are more ironies to our marriage culture. According to thecostofwedding.com, a website I randomly found, the average wedding costs $26,444 in America. Yet, think about this, the emphasis on the event, this wedding, the wedding event often eclipses the very point of of the event itself, which is the marriage. You think of this irony that fathers will spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to marry off their daughters while exporting his responsibility to prepare his daughter for marriage to a youth pastor. Which, I'm not denigrating youth pastors. We need youth youth pastors talking about marriage. Please hear me. But we need to see that the primary place that preparation for marriage happens is within the family. Couples will invest all this time with invitation lists and picking out the right colors and picking out the right photographers hundreds of hours, but yet they'll spend four hours with a pastor in premarital counseling and we'll consider that sufficient. So the message of mass media and culture hasn't translated into the experience of how marriage is faring as an institution in American culture. So we have to ask this question of what's driving this understanding of marriage? One that sees emotional emotional and sexual fulfillment as the main reason for entering marriage. So I want to begin by simply kind of beginning with this assumption that marriage has undergone several redefinitions and is now, right now in America, in a state of freefall. And we see this profound transformation occurring because of of the sexual revolution. And I'm going to explain what the sexual revolution is here in a second, but I want us to consider these sobering realities. That marriage rates are at an all-time low, that fewer and fewer people are actually marrying in this country that younger Americans are marrying later in life than ever before, as Owen mentioned, that younger Americans are having more children outside of marriage than ever before. Then, Rather than seeing marriage as a foundation that one enters adulthood on, it's seen as a capstone to adulthood and something one enters only when they have all the right degrees, all the right money in their bank account, and they have all their ducks in a row. 
we have this new phenomenon, it's not really even new really, that cohabitation, which is in many cases just replacing marriage altogether, provoking one news outlet to call it the new normal. And statistically, America since the 1960s and 70s has had a divorce rate hovering between 40 and 50%. And of course, we can't ignore or leave out same-sex marriage. June 26th, 2015, the Supreme Court acting as five philosopher kings, steps in and overrides the definition of marriage that has undergirded all human civilizations since the beginning of history. So what happened? And what happened is a sexual revolution, which was a movement or a product as a result of economic opportunity, youth rebellion in the 1960s and 1970s. But what we saw in the sexual revolution is that advocates of sexual freedom thought that they were empowering individuals to experience the essence of freedom. There was so much material prosperity at that time that you were no longer focused on just getting by. You could explore more entertaining and recreational aspects of life. And one of those things they thought was recreational and free was just sex. So it was, again, this this regime of personal autonomy. Out with the old moral order of sexual repression, as the assumption goes, and end with a new moral order of sexual celebration. So what many call the sexual revolution has helped to reshape the imagination pertaining to marriage and family life in America. Same-sex marriage, for example, is simply the latest iteration or example of marriage's ongoing redefinition that began long ago when the sexual revolution actually began its process. Now, many of you in this room might think that, man, we got to same-sex marriage so quickly. Uh, There was no same-sex marriage uh, regime in the world prior to the year 2000. So how did we get here so fast? Um, But ladies and gentlemen, if you look at what's happened as far as the academic arguments that have been made, the cultural attitudes that have been cultivated, and the court rulings issued over the last four or five decades, how we've arrived at our current destination on marriage is not surprising at all, but it's like a logical sequence or it's a domino effect carried out, again, as academic arguments, the courts, the culture, and the laws have all kind of swirled together to create this perfect storm of marriage's redefinition. So let's ask this question of how particularly has American culture redefined marriage? So we can't understand that our culture's definition of marriage today without first understanding the the redefinition that occurred in the past. Again, we are simply the recipients of a culture that began redefining marriage long ago. So here's how I briefly want to summarize how marriage has been redefined. And it's it's kind of um, academic, so stick with me here. A redefinition occurs when the goods, benefits, and privileges of marriage have been mistakenly and wrongly divorced from the context of marriage itself. I'm going to repeat that. We've redefined marriage because the goods, benefits, and privileges of marriage have mistakenly and wrongly been divorced from the context of marriage itself. That we as a culture have wrongly taught that we can experience the blessings of marriage and the fruits of marriage and the goods of marriage and the blessings of marriage apart from marriage itself. So in general... A redefinition occurs when something's essence or nature has been altered, added to, or subtracted from. You think about um, water, H2O. If you add to or subtract from that, you no longer have water. You have some redefined substance. So again, in the case of marriage, a redefinition occurs when the goods of marriage are removed from marriage itself and experienced elsewhere in a cheapened, substituted, and bankrupted form. So once the goods of marriage are capable of being realized apart from marriage, the need to enter marriage in order to experience those goods and benefits becomes less necessary. Now there's great debate with Christian ethicists about all the purposes or the goods of marriage, but I'm going to name three just for today. And these goods are romantic union, companionship, and procreation. And what we're going to see and what I'm going to show you is that these goods have all been separated from the bounds of marriage, which makes the likelihood of marriage's further redefinition simply inevitable. So we see redefinition occurring in five different ways in American society. The first 
is what I would call with premarital sex, or what I would call recreational or non-committal sex. Uh, again, sexual revolution, 1950s, 1960s, this idea with more material prosperity uh, that sexual intercourse can be experienced outside of marriage. Now, honestly, we all know that people have been having premarital sex since the beginning of time. But what happened in the 1950s and 1960s is a weaponized form of, re of um, recreational sex, uh, partly uh, because of such things as contraception, which I will get to that in a few minutes and talk more about. So if you think about what happened in the 50s and 60s and evolving to today, that over time, social taboos around promiscuity have lessened so that the sacred assumption that sex be reserved for marriage itself is now taboo. Again, the idea that sex was, a, was something privileged only for spouses became outdated. No longer was the marital act, what scripture calls the one flesh union, believed necessary to occur only within marriage. We have to see that once sex is removed from the marriage, which the Bible assumes is the proper and only context to experience it, sex, marriage, and the goods that comprise it become separated from one, to, from one another. We see this notion of intercourse being inherently conjugal. As When I say conjugal, I mean related to husband and wife in a covenantal marriage, echoed again in Genesis 2 with this one flesh union language, which is a very visceral, vivid display of, what's, of what God says is happening in marriage, that two become one. There's a real new entity taking place. We also see this in 1 Corinthians 6, 5, 5, 15 through 17, where Paul says to flee sexual immorality, because according to Paul's argumentation, to sexually join one's self to an individual not your spouse is to engage into something that's assumed to be strictly marital in nature. So to this line of thinking, a sexual act is a conjugal act and therefore a marital act. He says to flee, um, flee the, uh, don't have sex with prostitutes in 1 Corinthians because he's saying each and every time someone has sex or has intercourse with someone, you're enacting a marital union without the intention of marriage behind it. So, summarizing, once sexual intimacy is severed from marital intimacy, a redefinition of marriage and what it is reserved for has taken place. Secondly is contraception, another aspect of redefinition. And I want to say up front, when I, when I say the word contraception, many of you probably went on your heels like, oh gosh, oh no. Uh, I'm not up here to preach against all forms of contraception. That's not the goal. In fact, what I'm talking about when I say with contraception is what has happened when industrialized mass contraception took root and became weaponized as a cultural artifact. So how does contraception and the mass production of that um, equal a redefinition? We have to understand that sex seals or bonds the marriage union and can bring forth new life. Through the sexual union of a husband and wife, the potential for children and the common task of caring and providing for any children are united together. Um, again, though contraceptive devices vary, and indeed, while some forms are more morally problematic than others, contraception by its very nature acts to disrupt or thwart what would otherwise be the logical purpose of sexual intercourse, which is new life. Well, it's one reason God gave us sex. It's not the only reason, but it's a, one of the big reasons God gave us that. So contraception forged a new paradigm of sexual activity, and it was this paradigm, childless sex. For the first time as a culture, we in America could have unfettered sex, recreational sex, without the fear, so-called fear of children, as an outcome. So once the effects of sex can be cut off from the premises of sex, it would not take long until sexual activity would be misused. And what do we see happening right now? There's not been a wave of better treatment for women with the advent and production of contraception. It's allowed men to basically be the very worst of themselves. It's allowed women to be taken advantage of. So on the assumption that sex is wrongly no longer reserved for the, mar for the marital union, coupled with the introduction of childless sex, yet another redefinition of marriage has taken place. Once the idea is introduced that sex must no longer be procreative, 
or allow for the possibility of bringing forth new life, we see how contraception's contribution to marriage, to marriage's redefinition, cannot be emphasized too strongly. Third is cohabitation. Um, a few years ago, I went, I went to my cousin's wedding in central Illinois, and it was baffling. I think I was 27 at the time. I was married with a child and driving in my minivan to the reception. And um, upon entering the reception and looking at uh, everyone assembled here at the wedding reception, I soon realized uh, that I was the only person there married and with children as a 27-year-old. Um, in fact, I had a friend come up to me. And he, had, he said, man, Andrew, you've been really, really successful so far. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you've, you've, you're married, you've got a job, um, you've got a kid. And I, I was kind of, I was like, well, thanks, man. It's great. Uh, but it, after thinking about that, it made me realize that the, the floor for success in America used to just be the norm. That men would grow up, you would get jobs, you would, have a, you would have a wife, you would take care of your children. And now marriage again has become so eroded and collapsed that even being married at 27 is now seen to be out of the ordinary. So again, cohabitation, uh, this practice of living together prior to marriage or in the place of marriage altogether has become routine and often assumed as a standard practice before, someone, or before some couple even gets married to begin with. Um, this phenomenon communicates something very clearly, that deep, lifelong commitment that only marriage was once believed to offer individuals is now available through a pseudo form of marriage known as living together. Singles unsure of whether their potential mate meets all their own criteria that is only their criteria that they determine, so they think, utilize this practice in order to basically test drive a spouse. But marriage entered into rightly refines those who commit to make their marriage work, regardless of whatever unpleasant habits one spouse discovers in another. Again, marriage is not just about compatibility. So once sexual intimacy and lifelong companionship are severed from either a legal or covenantal marker like marriage, what has happened? A further redefinition of marriage and its inherent connection to companionship and fidelity has taken place. The fourth redefinition, and the one of us are probably most acutely acquainted with in this room is divorce. Prior to the 1970s, one had to admit fault in order to obtain a legal divorce. Usually we call that the three A's. Abu uh, uh, adultery, abuse, or abandonment. You simply couldn't just walk out of your marriage because of inconvenience. And today, with no-fault divorce, the law has upheld as an institution once assumed permanent to long no longer be permanent. And no ph phenomenon has helped to destroy marriage and cause relationship burnout more than the pr um, prevalence and availability of divorce and not without enormous social costs in its wake. From economic hardship for single mothers to the emotional turmoil by children who are experiencing a severed marriage, divorce has fundamentally altered the family makeup of Americans. So again, how do we see this redefinition occurring? That if marriage is no longer a bedrock of permanence like it was, or like it was assumed to be prior to the 1950s and 60s, the possibility of, its, um, of it being dissolved and abandoned amounts to another redefinition. And fifth, the final redefinition, which brings us to basically the logical consequence or the domino effect of what's been put in place by culture is same-sex marriage. So how do we arrive at this point where persons in the same-sex community consider themselves, consider themselves eligible for marriage? And here's my answer. Because once again, the goods of marriage that are so enticing and inherent to marriage are now assumed widely available apart from the conjugal union of a husband and wife. And once the connection between marriage and family life is severed, once, or, sorry, once sex is believed to function non-procreatively and once companionship is esteemed and, a, and valued apart from a bond of permanence, it is necessarily logical that the LGBT community will desire to imitate and enter what heterosexual marriage once exclusively fulfilled in its own bounds. 
Thus, it should be no surprise that once the goods of marriage have collapsed beneath the weight of heterosexuals wrecking and redefining it, attempts by LGBT, LGBT persons to experience not only the goods of marriage, but the essence of marriage will occur as well. And let me be very clear. Um, I'm not up here today to complain about uh, all that homosexuals have done to wreck marriage. Heterosexuals have done a profound disservice to marriage and society. But still at the same time, same-sex marriage represents what I would call the height of irrationality that follows from marriage's breakdown. You think about this, the, the logic of same-sex marriage presents no limiting principle in itself that won't, further away, that won't further chip away at marriage. That there's no inherent principle within same-sex marriage that explains why getting rid of its complementary structure won't also lead to getting rid of its exclusivity and permanency as well. Because again, marriage is based on this truth of the complementarity of the sexes. Man is made male and female in a permanent, exclusive, monogamous union. Men and women become um, fathers, or men and women become um, husbands, husbands and wives, becomes fathers and mothers. That's the sequence of marriage. So again, marriage is in a state of free fall in America. And by altering the real things, substitute forms enter into the equation. Now, proof is in the terminology that our brave new world is conco concocting about marriage and human sexuality. And we see this um, acutely happen with the rise of same-sex marriage. And so I'm going to go through a few lists of words that are now um, becoming common in the American vocabulary. One of those words is a thruple. A thruple is a word similar to couple, but it's the, con it, the concept is involving three people. And this is a real term used in a New York Magazine profile of a couple, or of a, of a thruple, of three persons. We have a new word called wed lease. And this was an idea promoted by a lawyer in the Washington Post who suggested that marriages should be term limited. So that if you want to get married, you can set the terms for five years. And then if you have, you, you can re renegotiate or re-up for another five after that. And I'm not making this up. You can go and search this at the Washington Post. Wed leases. Another term, monogamish. Monogamish. I wish I were joking. I'm not. As opposed to monogamy that restricts sexuality to only those in the marriage, this new concept has been championed by columnists like Dan Savage in Seattle, who suggest that marital infidelity is okay as long as you're open and honest about it with your spouse or your significant other. We have another phrase called conscious uncoupling. This phrase was used by celebrity Gwyneth Paltrow when she announced that she and her husband, though divorcing, were undergoing a conscious uncoupling that refuses to see, refuses to see their divorce in negative terms. So again, you have this understanding that we've redefined marriage, and same-sex marriage represents kind of the culmination of that. If marriage is no longer complementary, it means based on the distinction of a man and a woman. Why? Should it be, why should it be permanent? What principle restricts it to permanency? Why should it be exclusive? What's so special about the number two once we remove this most foundational principle of complementarity, as Owen hinted at this morning? So I've spent the first long part of this talk being really negative. So we need to build a positive case, and I want to talk about the public relevance of the Christian worldview on marriage, and creation, vocation, and the glory of God, because we can't just stay critics. So why can't we give up marriage? And I want to introduce this understanding that marriage is inherently creational. It means that marriage exists. It really is something, it inheres in the natural order, in the fabric of the universe. Marriage is one of those features that Paul echoes in Romans 1 that reflects God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, that have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Again, things that have been made, male and female. They correspond to each other. So we need to rehabilitate this idea of what I call creation theology. 
creation theology. If you're walking away with one thing today, it's that phrase. And Christopher Ashe is a British theologian, and he, he defines creation theology this way. The value of creation theology is that it speaks to all people without exception and for all time. It is neither sectarian nor cultural. Rather, it is universal in its scope and eternal in its significance. What this means is that the very fabric of our moral order is at stake in how we testify about marriage. Marriage is about, is, is about the very integrity of God's creation. It is about the integrity of Jesus Christ, the Logos, who orders marriage as he does every other inch of his cosmos. Christopher Ashe says this, the created order is deeply rooted in all creation. It is not the preserve of any locality, any period of history, or any culture, nor is it applicable only to the people of God. He says this, this is important in view of the confusion surrounding the supposed difference between marriage and Christian marriage. Marriage is an ordinance of creation, not a regulation of the church. It may be entered outside the sphere of faith, and when entered from within the sphere of faith, it does not change its essential character. Couples may have different levels of understanding of the purposes for which marriage was ordained, but those who know neither the creation origins nor the redemptive significance of marriage may yet marry. Again, this is still Christopher Ashe. He says, and then they may, and, and then they marry. They do not partially marry because they are outside the church, and they do not marry in some superior way if they are within. Now we always go back to Genesis when referencing marriage, and I want to go back in particular really quickly to show the creational scope of what God is doing with marriage in Genesis 2. 24 to 25. I'm going to read it really quickly. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So what do we see in this passage? We can easily gloss over this, but this passage is so small, but so um, loaded with what God is doing in creating marriage as a creational ordinance, as a creational institution. We see that it's applicable to all persons at all times by virtue of being human. And if it is creational, it's also given for the sake of maximizing human experience and human flourishing. And I could spend the next hour talking about all the ways in which marriage's breakdown has harmed children, it's harmed, and, it, and how it's harmed um, women. But God gave us marriage for the sake of flourishing between men and women in all of society because marriage is the bedrock of society. We also learn from this passage that while marriage may be ultimately Christian, it's not exclusively Christian in this era of redemptive history. Atheists can enter real marriages. They can be happy and flourish because marriage is an institution available for all persons who meet the criteria for marriage. And that simple criteria is man and woman coming together, uniting in a bond of permanence and exclusivity forever. We also see that marriage is pre-political, that it exists prior to the state. So if it exists prior to the state, it means that the government recognizes marriage. It does not create marriage. It does not invent marriage. It, doesn't have, it does not have the authority to define what marriage is. It recognizes what marriage is. We also see in Genesis 2 this understanding that marriage is bodily, that marriage unites persons at all level of their being, bodily, emotionally, and spiritually. We see that a real one flesh union has taken place, not like a one flesh union has taken place, but a real new actual entity has come into place when marriage happens. We see a change in status, that they leave father and mother, they cleave to one another, and they are, they are in that themselves a new family. We see that it's limited to two persons, man and woman. We see that marriage is heterosexual or complementary. Again, that if we remove the complementarity of marriage, marriage itself crumbles altogether. And from Genesis 2, we see that marriage is permanent, which it means it's, it's, it's assumed to be um, enduring through all of a person's life. And finally, it's monogamous, that you're committed only to that person sexually. So that's the creational component of marriage. What's the vocational component? component of marriage. Genesis 128, we read, 
And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We see that marriage is oriented to and fulfilled by the procreation of the species that results in the ongoing care and creation of culture. That marriage represents an ongoing act of creation and is the process through which God is advancing the next generation of kingdom citizens. But also that marriage demonstrates how societies, not just lone marital units, are established. You think about this, every one of us in this room is implicated in someone else's marriage. It's an inescapable reality of our existence. Marriage is what links the generations together. Marriage is something that's never static, it's always dynamic. It links us all together. And and Jesus reaffirms this creational structure in Matthew 19. He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are joined no long, or, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. This means that Jesus reaffirms the creational and the vocational structure of marriage. And this means that Jesus has authority over marriage because Jesus himself orders marriage. We see that in Colossians 1, John 1. Then in Ephesians 5, this emphasis Again, on the redemptive aspects of marriage and Jesus' authority over it. Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So this raises a question. How do we relate creation theology and redemption? How do we relate, how do we relate creation and redemption together? And Christopher Ash has a great very short statement here. He says that creation theology is the foundation of kingdom theology. The kingdom is the fulfillment, redemption, and transformation of the created order. This means that we can't leave marriage alone only to chapter one. We have to read through to the end to see what God is doing with marriage. Ash also says this of Genesis 2.24, that the one flesh union is the proleptic or first preaching of the gospel for the first marriage foreshadows the climactic marriage of the Lord with his people that we see in Revelation. So we come to this truth that marriage exists ultimately because of the gospel. In God's mind, he put forth this institution as the most visceral and vivid example of the power and beauty of the gospel. That God did not make us spouse A and spouse B, but he made us men and women. And somehow, in this profound mystery that Paul speaks of, it images the beauty and the power of the gospel. Now, many in this room right now hold all the right theological convictions about marriage. But some of you are tempted, as I said earlier, to believe that since the Supreme Court has supposedly settled the matter, that it'd be easier just to kind of sit down and and shut up and to just get the church out of the civil marriage business altogether. That if we can just have our little ordinances and services over here, we can let the state do whatever it's want, do whatever it wants. And here's why that is mistaken. And please, if you're you've tuned me out so far, tune me in right now. First off, marriage is not simply an ecclesial ordinance, as I've said so far. Marriage belongs to creation, and everyone can enter authentic marriages. Secondly, as it pertains to same-sex marriage, to allow any institution in society, like the government, to promote a falsehood, robs God of his glory, and does not love your neighbor. Now, I want to be very sensitive and compassionate when I say this, but same-sex marriage is an anthropological heresy. By that, I mean that same-sex marriage doesn't actually exist. The state believes it's issuing licenses that create same-sex marriages. But ontologically, what I mean by that, in, in God's way of seeing things and what really matters because God gets to define reality, there is no such thing as same-sex marriage. And what's worse, if the church sits back 
and, has, is, and is indifferent to this topic. We become silent on a topic and an issue that the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians will lead people to not inheriting the kingdom of God. We must insist that contrary to how love is thrown out so commonly today, that it is not loving to teach a view of marriage. Quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, that will send people to hell. That's not my opinion, that's the Bible. Three, we don't have the authority to redefine marriage or cede the definition of marriage to those for whom marriage does not belong. Marriage, quite frankly, isn't ours to give up. Marriage is God's idea, not the idea of five philosopher kings sitting on the Supreme Court. Fourth, marriage is what the Bible says it is, or else marriage doesn't really exist at all. To make marriage malleable enough is to extinguish marriage altogether. Either it is or it isn't. Like water, it either has a definition of shape, a poise, or it does not. And if we truly believe who God is and what he has revealed in his authoritative, wonderful, beautiful truth, then marriage does not belong to the state. It does not belong to democracy. It belongs to God. And it requires God's people to testify to that truth about what marriage really is, why it matters, and the consequences of redefining it. And fifth, those telling you that you can be Christian and support same-sex marriage are apostles of a false gospel. They are calling upon an authority of their own. They're denying scriptural authority and endorsing a practice, again, for which Paul says, if you practice such things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If we believe the gospel, then marriage isn't just about abstract propositions. Marriage is about testifying to what is true and false about reality. Many in this room, like myself, love to quote Abraham Kuyper's famous line that there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And if we can't say that about marriage, we are not being faithful to either that quote, but much more, we're not being faithful to God's sovereignty or his word. So, lots of bad news. Let's get some good news. We're going to end on a good note. The good news is that heresy helps refine orthodoxy. You think about all of the church's debates through history and its its heresy debates, orthodoxy has always come out pristine and beautiful and it wins. Orthodoxy wins. Chalcedon gave us great Christology. And today, the debates we're having on marriage and, and anthropology will ultimately strengthen the church. We are going to come out stronger as a result of this. Another opportunity, the present dispute and challenges facing marriage give the church the opportunity to testify to the truth that we have new opportunities to be fools for Christ. And this leads to this question of the cost of defending marriage. I understand how unpleasant it is to talk about marriage in today's context. I really do understand it. It's uncomfortable. It's one of those issues you just prefer to ignore sitting around the dinner table. But have you embraced what it means to be a fool for Christ? Justice Scalia, who passed away, um, actually, I guess two weeks ago today, after his passing, a quote got passed around on um, Facebook that just blew me away about being fools for Christ, he said this, God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools and he has not been disappointed. (laughs) Devout Christians are destined to be regarded as fools in modern society. We are fools for Christ's sake. We must pray for courage to endure the scorn of the sophisticated world. If I have brought any message today, it is this, have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity. Be fools for Christ and have the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world.
Ladies and gentlemen, if that isn't a call to pilgrim theology, I don't know what is. Now, some of you in here are tempted right now to say this, but the Bible says not to say this. In Ecclesiastes 7.10, it says, Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. For the Christian, we live with a deeper sense of history. America and its Supreme Court doesn't get to write the full script on what's happening with marriage. It doesn't get to write the full script of what's happening with the church and the world. And why is this? Because the Christian is the person who is bathed in hope and sees every present challenge as an opportunity to be joyfully faithful. Now, I'm getting long in my talk here. I'm going to be quick in my conclusion. A while back, earlier, I guess maybe late in 2015, there was an article that came out in Vanity Fair. And uh, I can't recommend you going and reading it because it's profane and awful, but it's eye-opening to what is happening with our culture's view of sexuality. And this Vanity Fair article was a long, long, long profile about users of this app called Tinder. Side note, if you have Tinder, you shouldn't. So Tinder is originally designed for people to kind of flick through, I believe, to figure out if you think someone's attractive or not. But what it's become is basically a hookup app. And so this profile um, of people and users of this app, it's profiling them and and their use of the app and and, um, the amount of sex they're having with strangers and how it has absolutely incapacitated young people from loving, faithful, covenantal marriages. That women feel that the only way they can get attention is through selling themselves sexually. That men who are given the opportunity to engage in as much free sex as possible then end up speaking horribly horribly about these women in the article because they just view them as sexual objects that apps like these basically allow the worst of the male instinct to come through. But what the article really does, it captures the silent screams and the heartache brought on by the sexual revolution and the collapse of marriage in today's culture. Longing for deep intimacy, women are seen as objects to conquer rather than as delicate counterparts to be loved and pursued. Again, men are reduced to the very worst of male sexuality, seen as primitive hunters, looking to copulate with as much and as often as and with anybody as will allow them. It screams heartache. So what do we say to this as a church? It means that as we look around at the carnage of the sexual revolution, there are going to be refugees of the sexual revolution, as my boss likes to say people burned out by the world's vision of sexuality. And that we as Christians have to stand in the gap and proclaim something more good and more true and more beautiful. What the world is offering as far as a sexuality is it's, it's a replacement theology. Fornication, cohabitation, divorce, adultery, tender, like every other deviation from God's sexual roadmap is simply a replacement theology based on the zeitgeist of a contemporary culture. And let's be clear, it is impossible for there not to be a sexual ethic guiding our deepest convictions. It's a question of whose ethic is going to win out. And what we're seeing right now, and it ought to break our hearts, is that the world's vision and living out of sexuality is not bringing happiness. It's not bringing flourishing. It's harming people. And why? Because sin fails people. It leaves them hollow. The Christian church must offer something better to the culture around us. We have to be the vanguard that shows that marriage is a glorious service unto God. It's a holy office. Again, this isn't to denigrate singles at all. I love what Owen said about singles. But if you find yourself in a marriage... You have to see it as a holy office that God gave you to glorify him, 
to care for society, to care for your children, and to testify to the truth. I want to end by quoting Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who I think has been alluded to so far tonight. While he was in prison for an assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler, he wrote a marriage sermon for his niece and his best friend, Eberhard Bethke, and he couldn't even deliver the sermon, but he wrote it. And Bonhoeffer concentrates on marriage as a holy ordinance, packed with limitless potential to glorify God and bless the world. I'm going to read this quote, and then I'll be finished. He says, Marriage is more than your love for each other. It is a higher dignity and power, for it is God's holy ordinance through which he wills to perpetuate, perpetuate the human race till the end of time. In your love, you see only your two selves in the world. But in marriage, you are a link in the chain of the generations, which God causes to come and to pass away to his glory and calls into his kingdom. In your love, you see only the heaven of your own happiness. But in marriage, you are placed at a post of responsibility toward the world and mankind. Your love is your own private possession, but marriage is more than something personal. It is a status and office. Just as it is the crown and not merely the will to rule that makes the king, so it is marriage and not merely your love for each other that joins you together in the sight of God and man. As you first gave the ring to one another and have now received it as a second time from the hand of the pastor, so love comes from you, but marriage comes from God above. As high as God is above man, so high are the sanctity, the rights, and the promises of marriage uh, and the promises of marriages and its love. It is not your love that sustains the marriage, but from now on, the marriage that sustains your love. Let us pray. Holy Father, you have given us something beautiful in marriage. It's something that you've created. It is yours. We receive it with glad acceptance and we testify to its truth today. And Father, I pray that all of us in this room, in whatever circumstances or whatever our paths, that you would give us grace, which we know you will because you love us through your Son. And Lord, please call us to faithfulness. Embolden us to testify to the truth of your word, to your creation, to the institutions that you have given to us. Lord, help us to bear the scorn of the world with joy. Lord, let us bring you glory in all that we do, in, in every way through which we live. We pray in your name. Amen.